Okay, this is a response video to Everything Hurts podcast coverage of our transparency audit. In the video, I will address some concerns raised, but mostly be clarifying misconceptions about the initiative. So let's listen. We, in this episode, are going to talk about something which uh, a bit of a bit of a brouhaha. Uh, which came up about a week or two ago, and this was in relation to this transparency leaderboard, which was proposed by Curate Science. And essentially, this Curate leaderboard collects the results of a so-called transparency audit for a body of research. And in this example, they were doing it for ten researchers. And to give you a bit of background, in case you didn't uh, you didn't catch this. There was three components which made up the scores for this leaderboard. Firstly, are your articles open access? And I think it's important to say that this isn't a preprint or an author accepted manuscript does not count in this leaderboard. Okay, that's not true. What was meant is no preprints that are not the version of record. And since then, we've lowered the open access requirements to now include green OA, which is any form of self-archiving of the article version of record posted on a personal website or anywhere. So as long as it's the accepted version of record, then it meets the requirement. Second bit, open data um, with exceptions for confidentiality reasons. And third, basic disclosures. So this includes competing interests, um, and they use PLOS's policies for what constitutes a competing interest, which is sensible, and whether you declare your funding sources. And so, yeah, instead of looking at individual papers, authors are rated on their body of work, and you're assigned a, a rating, which is a percentage of your articles that fulfill these three transparency categories. And if less than half of your articles reaches criteria, then you do not meet the curate science transparency standard. So for, for instance, if your work gets audited, then you are given the opportunity to check and verify the results. And there was an interesting thread on Twitter with one of the researchers saying that, hey, I, I actually, I'm on the leaderboard and I was contacted to, to do this. And <laughs> I never agreed to it, but it took me a lot of time uh, to, to, or took my students a lot of time to verify this. Okay, so this is another misconception. The audit verification or author verification rather is, is completely voluntary. Uh, Simone Schnall is kind of twisting things around. And an important thing to note is that during the audit process, she did not raise any of these issues. It was only once the Twitter mob was activated that she started saying that she felt coerced. All we said was, here are your transparency audit results. If you want to add to them, you can go ahead and do so. And indeed she did. She took the opportunity to post minimal data sets and her score went from 0% to 80%. And so now her research is more open to her benefit and the benefit of the research community. And we will be releasing our full email exchange correspondence so that you can decide for yourself. So essentially, this first leaderboard was, I think it was 10 researchers, more of a, a pilot example. But the website mentions they will be beginning random audits soon on researchers. And um, so this is was another major point of contention and given the community reaction we've decided that we will focus exclusively on random audits of publicly funded researchers so meaning researchers who have received public money public grants and given that this is more justifiable but note that the logic of of considering auditing anyone is that transparency, minimum transparency, is not optional for several reasons, conceptually, ethically, and personally. 
by definition, minimum transparency is the crucial ingredient that makes science work, which it, is that it allows independent scrutiny and independent checking. Minimum transparency is also required ethically as an ethical duty expected or required by the funding agencies and other public servant government codes of conduct. Uh, but it's also required personally for life and death situations. So imagine your loved one has a terminal illness. As a responsible family member, you would always choose a treatment based on transparent research rather than opaque research. Hence, logically, one must apply the same principle to non-life and death research. So this is the, the background of what's motivating these transparency audits. It's the fact that minimal transparency in science is not optional for ethical, conceptual, and personal reasons. And more importantly, the context is, as James will refer to in a moment, what's the problem we're trying to fix? This is the problem we're trying to fix. So after several decades of trying to improve transparency in academic research, the open data rates are still abysmally low. And so we're talking about 10% in biomedicine, only 2% in psychology, and only 7% in social sciences more broadly. And, and so this is a colossal crisis. When you have over 90% of published peer-reviewed academic research being opaque in 2021, uh, this is a huge problem. And carrots and unending badges and rewards and initiatives might have helped, might be helping a little bit, but it's clear that it's, it's not enough. And so that's the impetus for going beyond carrots. Yeah, so there was a lot of talk on Twitter about this, and I now that I've laid it out there, I want to get your initial thoughts on this transparency leaderboard, James. If you, if you say, I'm going to start a social movement, and everyone in the social throws a half brick at you and then goes to hide behind the showers. <laughs> well, not necessarily. Uh, there's plenty of cases in examples in history where when people start a social movement that is justified and greatly needed, the status quo will naturally push back. So it, it, it's, it's not necessarily the case that people being upset means that it's a bad initiative. And in this case, time will tell. But another thing to keep in mind is that even though the reaction in the in the comments on, on Twitter was were mostly negative, there was still a substantial amount of positive feedback and praise, especially if you consider the all the private messages and private emails we received, which were positive. Which is telling in itself that I think about half of the positive comments and messages we received were in private. And and so now it's more about listening to the concerns and trying to address any valid concerns and just having open consultations and improving and, and updating the audit approach to be even more accommodating, even more charitable to address any and all concerns. Why do you want it to work? Is it because it's supposed to be helpful for everyone? Yeah, this is what I was saying. The context is this. The vast majority of academic research is opaque, and this is to the det detriment of all researchers, all stakeholders of research, citizens, scientists, patients, and the millions of people who are suffering and dying from opaque research, opaque research, bad research, fraudulent research. So again, if we had a minimum transparency standard that we all agree to meet and we have random audits that 
keeps people honest, then this would be game changing. We could go from potentially, this could potentially be game changing because we could go from about 10% to normative, meaning greater than 50, maybe even 60, 70%. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is to look at parallels or, or analogies to this, which are tax audits and financial audits. So with tax audits, only about 1% of American taxpayers get audited. But even though the American taxpayer knows they might get audited, there's still about 20% of taxpayers who cheat. And so think about academic research now and think about how high the cheating rate is given that transparency audits don't exist, right? And so to us, it, it simply must be considered and we must try to implement these because the stakes are really high and again, the carrots aren't working. <laughs> And and so how many more decades how many more decades are we gonna wait for researchers to just selflessly start acting like angels? No. It's a colossal crisis and it's desperate times. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. And I want to reiterate that we're doing this in desperation. We're not doing this for fun, uh or for attention. Or anything else. This is really painful and really difficult initiative. We're doing this out of desperation because we've tried everything else and basically all the other initiatives and, and everything else we've tried has only led to nominal improvements in transparency. So that leads you to, and I saw a lot of people throwing rocks at this. I mean, some of it I didn't even understand. But like I <laughs> yeah. said, until uh, half past one last night, I've been on grant time. And grant time means the grant exists and everything down to my other per, uh, personal hygiene factors doesn't. And so a lot of people get the absolute flaming, screaming shits with how this was handled. Why? You tell me. You're going to have a better idea. People don't like the idea that they are getting audited on criteria that they never agreed to in the first place. Okay, again, these transparency categories are the most basic and the most generous and flexible. We intentionally chose the lowest and most generous transparency standard that still conform to current funding agency's code of conduct. And so, of course, people haven't yet been able to participate in what the categories are, but that's because they're already, they're already required. And they're the most minimum, most basic, actually. Um, we have higher standards, which we recommend to researchers, but this is just the minimum standard. So we lay out the specific where you can go and see for yourself that, that these basic transparency categories like open access, open data, and disclosing conflict of interest, these are already expected and or required from funding agencies like the NWO in the, in the Netherlands, NIH, European Union, ALEA, and many others. And so it's true, and this is maybe a valid concern, a valid reaction to be, ooh, who are these people to be saying that these are required? But again, it's the lowest and most generous standard possible. And, and we are now soliciting feedback and we are bending over backwards to listen very carefully to any and all concerns raised and we will improve as we've already done, made several changes to address concerns raised, including lowering the open access requirements, focusing only on auditing publicly funded researchers and or self-nominated researchers. So that's the other thing 
uh, important to mention is that while people are throwing bricks at us, there's five or six researchers who nominated themselves for audit, right? So again, it's very divided, but we have to keep in mind that it's it's if you ignore all the politically loaded and or defamatory comments, it's it's actually and you consider the private messages, all the private messages and emails of praise, it's actually turns out to be about 50-50 divided. And so we just have to keep drilling down in terms of what are other aspects that people have concerns with. But if you're applying for a grant, which you've been doing, part of that is uh, agreeing to a certain set of conditions. Most grant agencies will actually have an actual audit. This is typically a financial audit, but also an audit of uh, did you do or are you doing what you say you were going to yeah, do? Which- exactly. And so in another way, we're just doing the job that the funding agencies should have been doing like 10 years ago. And in fact, the Canadian funding agencies I've harassed for years and they're not responding and they're incompetent. So we're basically doing the job of funding agencies. and But I should mention that some agencies, funding agencies are better than others. So in our last grant, the Marie Curie, as part of the European Commission, they actually did, in a sense, it was kind of an audit where they said, this, your one publication is open access, but we notice it's missing the funding statement. And they even noticed that the date of my final report was off by one day. Okay, so if their European Commission can do that kind of checking at that level of detail, then they can do what we're doing. And so it's just a matter of time before the funding agencies wake up and or find more competent people. But even when they start doing it, they'll still need to be a more harmonized approach to organizing all this information in one place. And then it'll become a a, a new community where if you want to be part of this community where open is the default, then you have to meet the standard. If you don't want to participate, then that's fine. So you can stay over there in the current status quo community where basically most things are opaque, fraud and cheating are rife and or encouraged. So you can stay in that dirty, unproductive world, or you can just decide, yeah, I'll meet these minimum standard and I will enter the new era of open, transparent research. Yeah, of course. But you know before you actually start doing your research that this is what you agree to. And although people might not enjoy the, the time taken to actually run these sort of audits, you're just going to go, hey, that is what something that I have to do and it's something that I agreed to. But the difference here is that these people uh, or p- people are worried that they're going to be uh, <laughs> they're going to be audited on these standards that they didn't agree to. And I think time and time again. Okay, again, sure, they didn't agree to it, to those standards. But again, these are such low and generous standard that there is no lower standard and we allow retroactive curation of transparency information which appears to be another misconception so if you look at Simone Schnall for example whenever you see a little info icon this telling you that the conflict of interest and funding declarations were made retroactively on the author's own web page or their curate scholar author page and so you can actually click and see where this information has now been posted and and so you can retroactively meet the standard and we're only auditing papers within the last two years. Actually, that's another change. So we were doing last five years. 
Uh, but now we're only going to do the last two years and also include non um, non empirical article types, which are easier to meet because then there's only open access and COI disclosures. And in the new round of audit, which we will we'll release soon, we audit both empirical and non empirical article types. And we've come back to the same thing in that somebody takes something which is or may be standard in one field or one subfield, but doesn't necessarily apply to different fields. And one thing which I find really puzzling is the, is the fact, and, and you sort of picked up on this as well, is that preprints are not considered open access articles or author accepted manuscripts are not considered um, open access articles, and already well, it, you've got a situation. Only, it's only OA published. Well, that's a. I mean, you, frankly, you're going to end up with a class distinction on that. And also, let's let's say you audit me. What are you going to do with all my preprints? What are you going to do with all, with all my preprints that are open by definition, where the data yeah, is exactly. available? It doesn't count. So I get I get no open. I get no open credit. For full tra- zero full, mate full zero tra- percent full transparency <laughs> data available code available preprints uh, it's- no that's not true we as, as we clarified that does count a colossal error of calculation we don't need to go through the laundry list of the things we've found that eventually turned out and this is a, another point mentioning we're just auditing the transparency we have no intention and no time and resources to actually check the data so I haven't seen this misconception, but it's worth emphasizing that we don't check the data. You provide the link, uh, and we make sure the link works and points to the data set, and we just do a surface level check. Like this looks like a complete data set, or if there's three studies, okay, there's three data files, but we do not check the integrity or completeness and definitely don't check the reproducibility or, or check for errors or anything. So it's just check the transparency in relation to a very low and generous transparency standard. And that's it. Rather than picking specific people, why didn't they just start with Aardvark and go down? Why would you, why would you choose people? S- some, someone's already done that in terms of conflict of interest. There was, um, yeah, they? but I mean, look, yeah, but th- they wanted to do a, this was more of a. Exactly. It's already been done and it's the ones I just cited. Uh, Ionidas, Hardwick, uh, several other meta science groups are tracking the transparency a- across articles, across fields. But what really is needed to boost this, these numbers is to do it at the author level. Because that's where accountability comes in. So researchers have great power, but with great power comes great responsibility. And again, it's a small sample, but out of 10 people, by just giving them an opportunity to be more transparent and checking their stuff, most researchers took the opportunity and are now more transparent than the 99% 99% of all research. And again, most researchers thank us for the opportunity and tell us that it was a very insightful and valuable exercise. Yeah, and look, it, it, they, they picked this five-year threshold, but it right, doesn't necessarily years, right. reflect... It doesn't reflect that different research fields have different timescales. What about longitudinal research where you bloody submitted your ethics 10 years ago and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're following a... Exemption covers that. Again, right here. If you have ethical confidentiality reasons for not being able to post a minimal data set on a public repository, then you have an exemption. All you need to show is consent form and... You're good. And actually, I can show a real example. So Simone Schnall, for one of her papers, this Gilchrist and Schnall 2018, they did have a consent form that prevented public posting of the data for both experiment one and two. And she did share the consent form. And therefore, the standard is met. 
But the problem with this is that you are being marked on a thing that you did five years ago that you cannot change. You can't go back and address this. I mean, right, okay, <laughs> it's on, very hang difficult. On, hang on, hang on. You said you can't go back and address this, right? Then why did you say that case before? I said we'd come back to this. Why did you say that case before? It took someone who didn't agree to participate a ton of time. Why would it take you any time at all? You get an email no, and you go, good. okay, well, have fun. Um, and then someone goes through and evaluates everything that's available, right? No. So the, the reason that I say it took time is that somebody did the audit and then they emailed the researcher going, we did this audit um, and we would like to give you the opportunity to, um, oh, to check the veracity really? of our audit. Yeah, and then and then what happened was, according to the researcher, they said they were told if they didn't comply, that would be at the bottom of the, the leaderboard. Mm. Which- no, they were not told that. They were just said, here's your transparency audit result. And again, this is all public information. So we could have just published that because, again, we're just saying this is how transparent these researchers recent articles are according to the most generous lowest transparency standard possible while that still conform to current ethical codes of conduct but we were more generous than that and decided well let's email them and see if they want to add to information and so the time taken is time taken to actually post minimal data sets to the OSF or any other data repository. And in fact, uh, John Barge, Simone Schnall, and Susan Fisk in particular did uh, very efficiently start posting their data sets. Yeah, and you can't fix any of these things. You can't You can't make, make your article it open feels, access. You it can't... feels like with a completely different framework. Okay, again, that's not true. So a lot of researchers don't even realize their papers are not open access. And then they can just take the post print or the accepted version and put it on their website, put it on the OSF, and now they're meeting the standard. Same with minimal data set. Maybe you just hadn't got around to it. Several authors, that's what they said. Oh, I, was, I meant to get around to doing that, but it's pretty low on the priority list. And indeed, this is the same... In my own experience, uh, and in fact, I still have papers that I still need to make the data available, but it's just in this hard drive and this folder, right? So it, it's it's just going beyond carrots to incentivize behavior change using social comparison and using social dynamics. This is like something like this is, is perfectly straightforward. I mean, the, the- Oh, and the COI disclosure, the same thing. And, and more important, actually, because most journals or half journals still forget to ask. And authors just, again, are busy. And so you can go back and fix that and say, okay, here are my COIs for the last five years. The thing is, is like, what, are you, what are you adding that people don't know? It's just assigning a value to the, the researcher. It's, it's I mean, I know everyone's big into kind of social castigation these days but it it feels like i mean it would only be normative if you managed to do something like this with a lot of people within a subfield you know you think about how, how much how much this stuff changes between uh clinical research and non-clinical research uh Again, these are such basic categories that they, they, they do apply to any and all fields and subfields. If you can find specific edge cases, then let us know and we will address it. But um, open access, open data, COI disclosures, it literally applies to all empirical article contributions and open access and COI disclosures applies to all articles, even non-empirical ones. Um, you remember when we had Chris Jackson on? And he said, I can't release any of my data because it all belongs to fucking Exxon. Yeah? And like we had to ask them nicely for geological data in the first place. We can't give away their survey results. It could affect their share price. It could be picked up by Shell. It's proprietary stuff. So proprietary issue 
we've considered and that one needs more debate maybe our initial leaning is that proprietary information or intellectual property is not a valid exemption because again in science it, it's just transparency is is not an option so if you want to publish a paper with proprietary data then it should be marked as such and and therefore it, it it can't be scrutinized as thoroughly therefore you cannot be cannot put as much weight into the credibility of the results it, and so that's just part and parcel of saying well are you a company like facebook and you're doing research and you can't share the data well okay but in science minimum transparency is is not an option that's what makes science work open code would be a lot more important yes and actually open code is being considered and is already included in the next standard which is the recommended standard so this needs to be updated but uh so this is used to be the recommended minimum standard, and it had code and study materials. Uh, so now this, the minimum standard is is just open access, open data, and, and COI disclosures. The code will be for the higher standard, and so when we audit researchers, we tell them, you know, this is the minimum standard, but we recommend this higher standard, and can, we'll use personalized gamification to try to get researchers to be even more transparent um but yes open code is definitely on our radar oh and for non-empirical types that will also be part of it very soon so for simulation papers methods papers uh so your paper can be non-empirical but if code is relevant then that would be a requirement that should be checked and should be rewarded Otherwise, you're picking like 10 papers from the lady down the road and then you're breaking her kneecaps over something she may not have been able to control. (laughs) So, I mean, you're coming out trying to make a splash, I suppose. I mean, I understand where it's coming from. But, I mean, I saw so much... There's so much chat about it. Everyone, everyone Everyone lost their mind. Obviously, look, there's there's a lot of perceptions about this is the problem with giving everything a name and turning it into a fucking club. We can't just have practices and ideas. Everyone has to get little hats and, and rally behind, behind the center of an idea, you know? And the moment you, you, have, the moment you have a tendency within that, everything goes to shit. Again, I already mentioned it, but but sure, the, if you don't want to participate, that's fine. But the idea is that we try to create a new community where this is the minimum standard and then we have higher standards, but this is the minimum transparent. So you can see it as minimum transparency as the price of admission to enter the arena of science. And if you don't want to enter this new community, then that's fine. But, but know that once you do, then at least you can know that everyone's playing by the same rules. Because right now the current system is again, 90% of research is opaque and people don't follow the same rules. So you don't know how much people are cheating, to what extent, whether they're doping or worse. And so sure, it's it's a bit contentious, but again, these are desperate times and uh, minimum transparency is, is, is kind of the ultimate equalizer. And I think... Uh, they'll touch upon this audit approach might exacerbate inequalities, but I would actually argue the the exact opposite. Most researchers who are not well-known, who don't have the prestigious editorial positions working in prestigious uh, universities, it allows them to compete on a more level playing field with the prestigious top 5% of researchers, right? Because right now the top 5% of researchers, they get way too much power and they get, it's a lot easier for them to publish in the prestigious journals because of their prestige and because they don't have to meet a minimum transparency standard. 
but if minimum transparency standard is applied equally to everyone in all fields, then all of a sudden, the everyday no-name unknown researcher gains a lot. So, and this is also why it's probably contentious, because if you're a top 5% researcher, you're already winning or, or highly successful in this broken system. You have some some to gain, but you have mostly to lose from transparency audits and public transparency leaderboards. Whereas if you're in the bottom 95%, you have only to gain. But honestly, what it, it really it really comes down to like anything, anything like this is the product of consensus building. It's a product of lots of other people thinking it's a good idea. Yeah, go out, canvas people, convince them. We have. We've done that for six plus years, and several other groups have done that uh, unsuccessfully. There was some transparency checklist consensus approach, and it's not being used. It's opt-in. It, it's not being used. Again, the entire system is systemically broken at all levels, and so it's actually irrational to be transparent. So it's actually logical to be opaque. And so this is a bold, desperate move to, to go beyond carrots, to, to provide kind of a mild slap on the wrist. But it's justified, again, because minimum transparency is required in science, conceptually, ethically, and personally. I mean, this is, I, I don't want to sound like a fucking hypocrite because obviously I've done that with people, <laughs> yeah. done that with it's like Worth. long published histories of papers that I think, frankly, are not built from real data. There's people who are, you know, in, in, in some very straightforward sense, actually doing fraud. That's what I just said. Again, when transparency standards are not enforced, then fraud is rife. And, and if anything, it's logical to commit fraud. I used to joke to grad students, if you're not willing to commit fraud, then you can't compete in the system, just like the Tour de France. It is hard to do anything like this. And if you can't get out of your own way when you try and do it, it's going to be a problem. Right? If there's anything, because I mean, people will sniff that out eventually. If there's anything retributive about something like this, uh, it's not going to work. If there's anything that's crusading about something like this, it's not going to work. You're not actually offering people anything that they can have except a, a thing that has. A, I mean, if you if you do well, I mean, you're offering them a neg. Well, you're not offering them a negative proposition. Well, don't get in trouble according to me because you haven't done a thing. Well, not quite. Again, the 95 percent of researchers are unknown who can barely publish in journals that people read. So we're actually offering them quite a bit. We're saying meet this minimum transparency standard and then you can signal to the world, to your readers, that your papers meet a standard. And you can disagree with the standard. You can say it's too high, it's too low, but it's a standard and it's a start. And we'll address the issues as they come up and add more exemptions, add more grandfather provisions. Oh, and the other thing is that, that yeah, it is a metric, but, but the idea and the grant is about transparency. Our grant is, was about transparency metrics. But the idea is not that, ooh, I'm going to go and brag that like I have 90% transparency and, ooh, I'm so much better than Lauren, who's only 53%. No, the idea, is, it's, it's really a binary, you know, you meet the standard or not. It's like, it's not about really bragging about your specific number. It's more about, okay, there's a there's a minimum standard, there's a cutoff, and 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 we we meet it and then we go back to doing research, which is what we're here for. Right? It, like it's so really it it's not about competition and competing to, to see who gets the highest number. It's more about do you meet the standard or not? And let's go back to doing research. You know, what do you give them if they do well? A fucking badge, a little hat, a badge, 
Yeah, a badge and a widget, a widget, yeah, do, James. Do, 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 you, do you get m- m- mailed a, the, the copy of the latest Daniel Boone paperback? You know, do you, do you get five dollars <laughs> off at Bed Bath and Beyond? It's like you, it's it's a, it's a, so participating, presumably, you know, like being in it is an exercise in avoiding criticism. Wait, wait, wait! It's actually the opposite. Participating means you your research is more open to criticism. Uh, and the other thing is that if your research is already transparent, then the audit doesn't create any extra work. And actually, it's worth mentioning that five of the ten researchers audited already met the standard even before they were contacted and given an opportunity to further raise their score. Right. So that's important to mention. If if you're already being transparent in your research, you're already going to meet the standard, and the audit it will just be an opportunity to make sure everything's correct and make sure you haven't forgotten anything. I mean, what happens if uh, researcher number or author number two doesn't declare her conflicts of interest, yet author number three is getting penalized for that? So that's another misconception. So this is important to clarify. Currently, the audit checks the conflict of interest disclosure in the article. If it's missing, then we ask the audited author and only the audited author. Uh, And so as you can see here, no COIs to declare Rohrer. So that that tells you that uh, these retroactive disclosures only apply to the audited author. Uh, We're considering in the future, once our auditing software is more advanced, that if you're going to do an audit, Maybe we could try to audit all co-authors. And you go, let's have a go and be difficult about it. Of course it's not going to work. You just, you just, there's a point past which I wonder, I don't know how sincere this is. Um, well, time will tell. And again, we have people nominating themselves for audits and we have a large volume of praise and positive feedback, mostly in private, uh, and so time will tell. We will continue to listen carefully, have open debates. We've been invited to an open debate about transparency metrics that's organized specifically centered on our transparency audits in Tilburg. We will have other open consultations. We will keep listening, keep improving, keep adding exemptions and other uh, accommodation for differences across fields and subfields. Oh, we're also considering having a phase-in exemption period for junior researchers where you would only be eligible for an audit if you have if you exceed a total lifetime career number of publications. And we'll be adding several other changes and improvements that are under consideration that, w- that we are seeking feedback on. I really should have looked more closely into this, but um, man, I, and you can tell, you're looking at me. How do I look, Dan? <laughs> Disheveled, look, more, more than I usual. Look like <laughs> a bag of shit, <laughs> and it's not the it's not the fault of this excellent three Floyd zombie dust. It is. Look, I, I, it's a final final thing. I hope everyone who thinks that this is this is a shit idea and they they couldn't have done better. I hope everyone who, who you know and the people involved are assholes and whatever else, whatever the context is. Um, I hope one day you get to experience the astonishing annoyance of trying to start anything with a kind of public identity from scratch. It gives you a lot more empathy for anyone doing this in any context. Yeah. Because it's fucking hard. All of a sudden, it seems to have more recently, it, it seems to have morphed into... A, a, a stick of punishment that if you, and especially hearing these stories of a researcher being told, hey, St- if you don't story, comply with the story audit. Is plural? No, no, story. No. There was one. Oh, right. There was one. Okay. Yep. Yeah, on. maybe. Yeah. But look, that there was, there was only, there was only 10 researchers originally there. And exactly. Only one story. And it's a story. Uh, as I mentioned, Simone Schnall seems to be twisting things around and we will be releasing the full email exchange for everyone to decide for themselves. Uh, But again, we are going to 
be doing additional small scale audits of self nominated and publicly funded researchers. And we will further test the feasibility and go from there. This idea of highlighting people that haven't been doing the thing that you define. <clears throat> so if you, look, if you look at this leaderboard, there's one researcher who was below 50%, which is the threshold that they've decided is, 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 is failing uh, their, 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 their criteria. So the and they're in a different... Australian undergraduate marking system where you fail is at 50%. It feels a bit fucking arbitrary, doesn't it? Yeah, so they 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 pick fifty percent. So, if this was a we want to reward researchers and offer, um, look, this this could have been another badge system. We the thing is we already have badges for, um, open data. Exactly, and the badges have helped a tiny bit, but it's not enough. Open uh, open scripts, but the difference with that is is that's done for, by individual paper. But the idea is, and fifty percent is arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. 50% means it's almost the majority. And again, given that minimum transparency is not optional in science, 50% is actually very generous. Uh, in the future, we would want to see the percentage being closer to 80, 70 to 80% of one's recent articles meet this minimum, very low generous standard. It's so psych, psych, psychology biased. It's just crazy. Like, like, like you said, with maybe it's a, maybe it's a psychology initiative. I don't think either of us know uh, uh, what the the sort of focus of it was. But the, here's here's a, here's the thing. And as I mentioned, we are doing additional small scale audits um, of self nominated researchers, and the one the third audit will actually be a random audit of NIH researchers, which is mostly medicine and biomedicine and so we will prove it to you that it's also feasible in medicine but maybe we'll maybe we're wrong and we'll be proven wrong but time will tell but and by making these things easier both by providing the tools but also by providing the education people can go hey i can do this thing this song okay but again it's not working so almost 10 years after the Center for Open Science has made it easy to post your data sets, you're still talking about 95% of papers being opaque and not sharing minimal data sets. So it's clearly not working enough. important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.